hugs a day for survival, eight hugs a day for maintenance, and 12 hugs a day to grow. 12 hugs a day to grow. So I hope that some of you did some growing uh, during our meet and greet time this morning. We are looking to the Old Testament today, the hymn book called Psalms. Uh, the idea for this sermon came from my son, Zach. He's in a season of growth. He feels God's calling on his life to ministry. Um, a lot of times I will bounce things off of him and say, here's an idea that I have. What do you think about it? And, um, and he'll give some input. He has great insights. Um, Zach and I are sharing something that's so special to me. It's kind of like... I used to do with my dad when he was alive because he was a, a pastor too. And I would often just say, hey, what do you think about this? And he'd say, well, I don't know. Here, here's kind of what I feel. What do you, what do you think about this? And boy, we, you know, back and forth. And, and uh, Stephanie and I are just so thrilled with everything that God's doing in Zach's life. Like I said, the series is called Growth. And today's talk is titled... Grow through the seasons. Grow through the seasons. I hope you'll be back next Sunday when we finish up this teaching series. And then we are immediately going into our fourth season, the season of connection. Um, so far we've fulfilled these four seasons, uh, three seasons this year, because we have five reasons that we exist and we I taught the church vision statement all throughout January, and then from February up until now, we've been moving through these various seasons. A season of worship, um, a, a season of serving. Now we are in a season of growing, and then we're going to lead into a season of connecting, because that's also a very important part of of our uh, ministry, and then also that will lead us to the season of going. Let's read the scriptures together. This is Psalm chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the steps of, with the wicked. Let me, let me give that another shot. <laughs> Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. That word right there, that's where the title for this message comes from. Yields its fruit in season. There are seasons that we grow through. And I pray that each of us becomes aware of the season God has us in and where He's taking us and how He wants to move in our hearts and lives. That person's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. Everybody say not. Not, not. not so the not wicked. So the wicked. <laughs> they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now notice what happens here. He starts off by talking about walking, standing, sitting, walking in the way, of righteousness sitting not in the seat of the ungodly, not standing in the way of the wicked, walking, standing, sitting. He's talking about the circles that we move in. You stand somewhere, you walk somewhere, you sit somewhere. This is how life works. This is how we interface with our world around us. We're continually doing those things. And he says, it's blessed when 
you do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. In fact, pay careful attention to verse 1 and 2. Let's look at that again. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the seat of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the, of the Lord. The law of the Lord. And who meditates on His law day and night. Now, David uses some figures of speech in this psalm. For just a, a few minutes, I want you to... Um, let, let's go back to English class for a moment. How many of you loved English class? Okay, good. I, I loved it too. One of my faves. Uh, freshman year, true story, Miss Scott was failing me in English class. This, uh, this, is, this is God's honest truth. Mrs. Scott had a problem with alcohol, and she had a styrofoam cup that she kept in her drawer, and it was full of scotch. And she would drink throughout the day. And from day one, she had it in for me. I didn't even know why. Ninth grade kid, I mean, what's not to love about a ninth grade boy who's a freshman in high school? <laughs> And I mean, she just, she had it in for me. And I was trying hard. I was doing the work. I wasn't missing any assignments. That first six weeks, I had an F. And Mom wanted to know why. And I said, Mom, I haven't done it that. And it wasn't me. And she's got it in for me. Baloney. <laughs> Keith, you're going to go to Miss Scott in the morning, and you will apologize to her. All of our teachers said amen. I uh, see Miss Whitling back there, okay? Leslie right there. All of our teachers know this is a good thing. But the honest truth is I had not done anything wrong. But I did go to her and I said, Miss Scott, I'm sorry that I've not paid attention and I haven't done good work in your class. I apologize. And I just want you to know I'm going to do my best from this day forward. Do you know I got straight A's the rest of the year? And in the fourth quarter, fourth, six weeks, nine weeks, I don't even remember how they did it in Texas, fourth, six weeks, she got fired <laughs> because the truth came out. I, I kind of lost tabs on Miss Scott, but, um, but yeah, that, that is a true story. But English class, so remember what you learned in comp and red. Let's go back to English class for just a few moments. We have these things. Um, in every language called figures of speech. So think back to English class and remember some of these. Alliteration. Alliteration, when you use some consonants um, in several words in a row. That's called alliteration. Most tongue twisters are alliteration. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Alliteration. Do I dare try it? Peter Piper picked a peck of gold peppers. Let's <laughs> kind of do it slow. But the, that's alliteration. And, and that's, um, that's, that's when you have the consonant thing going on. And then there's one that does the same thing with vowel sounds. You might remember this, assonance. assonance. Anybody remember how that works? Assonance is when the vowels uh, sound similar and they repeat. Uh, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plains. See how that works? That's a use of assonance. Or how about this one, homonym? Any of you remember homonym? These are words that are spelled the same way, look the same way, except they have a different definition. The word left. Okay, is left, or are you talking about left, the opposite of right? Are you left, or do you mean the left? Like when you have left from the room. You leave the room. You left. Which one? Well, they look the same. They're spelled the same. That's a homonym. Or what about skate? Are you talking about when you skate on the ice? You just, you know, you get on your ice skates and you just glide across the ice? Or do you mean the fish? There's a fish named skate. Which one are you talking about? The context defines it. They're spelled exactly the same way. Those are homonyms. Now, David uses some figures of speech in Psalm number one. Here's a big $9 word. Do you remember this one? Onomatopoeia. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 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 
You ought to just say it out loud. You feel so proud and it's just fun. Say it. Onomatopoeia. And what an onomatopoeia is, is when a word sounds like what it does. A popular onomatopoeia is the word splash. Splash. It sounds like what it is. Probably a better one is the word splat. Okay, can't you just picture that? David actually uses an onomatopoeia. It's the word meditate. It's the Hebrew word hagah. And typically we think of meditate as that quiet reflection where we think on something and we bring it back up into our minds. Now, without, I don't want to be too gross, but just without being too gross, actually the Hebrew concept of meditate comes from a word picture of the old cow chewing the cud. The cow has four stomachs. The food goes down, comes back up, chew it a little more. Goes down, comes up, chew it a little more. Isn't that gross? <laughs> but that's the picture that it speaks of for us meditating. And here's an interesting concept. Most Jewish rabbis teach that this word Haggah is actually an onomatopoeia for when a lion is hungry. Hagar! <laughs> you will never think of me the same way again after that approach. In fact, I don't want any of you while we're in the middle of a sermon screaming out Hagar because you know you're trying to get to the restaurant, all right? I know some of you hungry lions. But... But does that sound like what we think of for meditate? Usually not. Usually we think of meditate as quiet, respectful, thinking about something over and over again. But actually, David is saying, blessed is the man who is hungry for God's Word. Hungry! Oh God! And then next, the scripture says that person, what person? The one who meditates on God's word like a hungry lion. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. The English majors in the crowd have already gotten point number two. It is simile. Simile of the saint. There's a, there's a play on words, a, a, a figure of speech. Sometimes it's called a literary device called simile. Now, do you remember what simile is? Simile is when you compare to something and you use the word like or as in the sentence. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. That's simile. And here we have the simile of the saint. It says, he's like a tree beside streams. Um, I think sometimes when we read Psalm 1, we think, well, that righteous person, I, I've got in my mind a picture of who they are. I mean, things just go well for them. They're just so seasoned. Everything seems to go their way. They're like a tree that's planted by the water. Man, I mean, they've got the Midas touch. Everything they touch turns to gold. And they're just so blessed. They're always generous. They're always kind. They, always, they don't seem to have problems. They just coast through life. Well, here's what this is actually teaching. That really, you determine the level of your releasing of God's blessings upon your life by how hungry you are. How hungry are you for God's Word? How hungry are you for prayer? How hungry are you to please Him and just to be with Him and to worship throughout your day? I mean, be honest with yourself. Do I really condition my heart for prayerful moments? Do I seek after Him? Do I search after Him? Am I that person? Am I that person? That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Yields its fruit in season. You picture 
this seasoned veteran, this warrior Christian who has many victories under their belt. It doesn't mean that everything has been a bed of roses because if you think being a Christian means that everything is just a bed of roses, have I got news for you. Sometimes it's hard serving Jesus. I'd rather just be real honest with you. If I'm going to go to the boogeyman, it's not going to be over lying, all right? I'm not going to tell you that you're all good, just going to be blessed and too blessed to be distressed and too anointed to be disappointed and everything is just rosy all of the time. Sometimes it's hard to be a Christian. But I can always tell you that God, He is so faithful and He has His ways of bringing His blessing back around and through the seasons and they give way to years and then before too long you realize I've been walking with Him for some time now and I can testify to His faithfulness. He has never let me down. He has always been faithful. So ask yourself, have I spent time hungering after the Word? <coughs> Have I really meditated on the Word of God? And then next, the Scripture says, verse 4, Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the Buckeye First Assembly of the Righteous. I was like, threw that right in there. Sorry. That was the Keith Howard translation. Um, this is how David wraps this up. Look at verse 6. It's an important statement. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. They are like chaff. This is also simile, but it's not simile of the saint. Here's the third point. Simile of the sinner. Remember, simile is like or as. Like chaff blown by the wind. Do you know what chaff is? Actually, uh, some translations or uh, some translations are corn husks. Can you just picture corn husk blowing by the, the wind and just no anchor, just being scattered? I mean. I don't know if there's any corn husker fans in the room. But the Nebraska's having a pretty good year so far. By the way, I you know I don't use the pulpit as a bully pulpit, but I I just have to say I got challenged on my Texas A&M Aggies this morning by Brother Pete back there. He just, he just and I I just got to say the Aggies are five and zero, oh, ranked number nine in the nation, and we're playing Tennessee next Saturday. Don't need me on Saturday, okay? <laughs> But the simile of the sinner, just like, just like chaff, no roots, not grounded at all, just blown from one thing to another. Paul in Ephesians describes tossed to and fro like as if on the waves of the sea. No grounding, no root. That's the way of the wicked. That's not what God wants for us. And we're supposed to notice and I, forgive me, I didn't put verse number 6 on the screen, but let me read it for you again. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We're supposed to notice the way. The way of the righteous. The way of the wicked. Just like I said at the start, this has to do with circles that you move in. You get to decide who you run with. You get to decide who you hang out with and, and what you do and what you participate in. And the way of the righteous is like a tree that's planted beside streams of water and the roots go down deep. The way of the wicked is just like <sighs> chaff. Here's the takeaway this morning. I always try to close the message with with one main point, something that, that you can take with you, something that really summarizes the whole message, and this is it. 
If you want the Lord to watch over your way, watch your ways. That's not very profound. That's true. If you want the Lord to watch over your way, then you yourself watch your way. Because that's, that's exactly what it says. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. If you don't know my family's story, um, my son Zach that I alluded to earlier, who um, is the one who helped me with this message, this concept, uh, is in prison. He's in prison for facing 18 years. It's been a very, very difficult uh, struggle for our family. And uh, with, with kids in the room, I won't go into detail about, about it, but I can just say that, that it was a very public and a very difficult stretch that we have gone through as a family. The media did not get everything right. Um, I, I have learned that media only wants to speak something that's sensational. Right. And if, if there's sensationalism, then that's, a, that's newsworthy. But it has little to do with facts. It has little to do with truth. And, um, but Zachary was guilty of, of elements of this crime, and, and he's paying very dearly. Um, but I can tell you that the great news, and most of you know this, the night of his arrest, actually early morning hours the next day, he got on his knees in the jail cell, and he rededicated his heart to Jesus Christ. And yesterday was 17 months. He has not wavered, not one iota. Um, during the first seven months of his stay, he led six individuals to faith in Christ in Sheriff Joe's jail. And, and then um, he's been in isolation since December 1st. So from December 1st to today, he's been in a jail cell 24 hours a day. Most of that time, he has had a cellmate, but there have been stretches where he has not. Um, right now, presently, at this moment, he does not have a cellmate, and uh, he, it's kind of a little bit of a welcome relief to him. He's got his own space. He can just, but you know, that gets pretty old pretty fast. He needs human contact. And so be praying about the next cellmate, who it will be, because it, it will happen. Um, but sometimes I just, I think back over really the last four years of our family's life and what has happened and how did we get here? How did it happen? I, I am absolutely just beyond words to think that, that my son, 21 years old, was in the jail cell with the second most wanted man in Arizona in 2007 in the hole for, tw for two weeks. <laughs> and every time Zach would open his Bible, he would feel the man shuffling underneath him in the other bed. He didn't know that he was opening the Bible, but every time he opened the Bible, he'd get restless down underneath him. And yet, irony of ironies, this man became God's instrument to put his, so to speak, put his arm around Zach and say, here's how you survive in here. Taught him the ways, taught him the ropes, and said, these are some things you need to know. I, I'm absolutely blown away that that uh, my son, um, there was a, a member of the Crips gang, if you don't know Bloods, Crips, and, uh, it's, it is the number eight worst gang in the history of the world according to a recent uh, release. And there was a Crip who came in to the jail. From day one, he just hated Zach. Didn't know why. Zach didn't know why. He did nothing to him. Um, but Zach, my, my family's just this way. Um, we love all colors, all races. We just kind of feel like that, that's why our church is the way it is. We love having every race represented because, the, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, it's kind of how heaven's going to be. Right? right? That's right. <laughs> and that's just the way we are. And my best friends growing up were black Americans. My sons, both of them, their best friends have been African Americans. 
both of them, their best three friends. It's just worked out that way. And, um, and yet this crip came. He said, Zach told me, Dad, did you know that crips have a certain walk? They have to walk a certain way. It's part of the... I didn't know that. But um, he would comment to other guys in the pod. And there, at this point, there's only 16 guys. And it was very tense. And he, he would say things about white boy over there. Stupid white boy. And mix in some profanity. And, and uh, one day, Zach... Um, they, they made jailhouse burritos. That's like his specialty. He, he and his roomie, his silly, they would, they would make jailhouse burritos. If you've never had one, I'll have to describe it later. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. But anyway, Zach felt led of the Lord to take the burrito over to the crib. And he gave it to him. And the guy says, literally, looked at him and said, Why? What's in it? No, oh, you trying to set me up? And Zach looked at this hardened gang member and said, No, I just wanted to do it for you because I love you. Yeah. And Jesus loves you. Amen. And he watched the hardness melt off his face. And the next morning they sat at a table for two hours and he shared with him about Jesus Christ. And this, he didn't give his heart to the Lord, but this man told Zach, I've never had anybody love me. I shudder to think that my son Zach was in a cell for three weeks with a member of the Mexican Mafia who is trying to get out told Zach, but I've done things that God will never forgive. And Zach told him, God will forgive you. And he said his face lit up. And he said, somebody one time told me that I crossed the line, that I could never be forgiven. And Zach said, oh no, no, you can be forgiven. And he told him about Moses, and he told him about Paul, and he told him about David, and men in the Bible, and some of their big blunders. And he said, God forgives those guys. You're not better than them, are you? Zach wrote me a, a note. Uh, well, actually, we, we went and picked up some of his books as he transferred it. As I continue to close, I... Yeah. <laughs> I really tried. I really tried. <laughs> but um, one of the books that we picked up when he transitioned out of the county and into state prison, uh, he had 15 books, had uh, over 1,500 postcards that people wrote to him. Zach, the other night, Zach got 18 letters at one time. <laughs> 18. He said, Dad, I'm setting records in here. That they're la it's laughable that they bring me this stack of mail. And some of the guys, they don't get mail at all. In fact, the member of the Mexican Mafia, who was pretty harsh when they were parting ways, said to Zach, Zach, do you think, do you think anybody from your church would write me a letter? And Zach said, you bet they will. So if you want to write him, come see me. I'll get you his information. Don't let me down. Don't let Zach down now. He, he stepped out there and said, you bet they will. But Zach was commenting about Psalm 1. He said, Dad, this is the season God's got me in. He said, I'm just in this season of growth, and I don't know how long I'm going to be here. But whenever God's ready for me to be out, then I'll be out. But if it goes full term, it just goes full term. It doesn't matter because I'm where God wants me to be. And I'm just going to minister for Him every possible way that I can. And He said, Psalm 1 reminds me so much of Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. And I hadn't thought of this. But here's Jeremiah 17, verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. No worries. It has no worries 
in a year of drought and never fails to bear. But I can tell you with a great deal of certainty, God has you right where you are on purpose. He, listen, He is not fooled by your circumstances. God knows where you are and He's working in this season. It could be that He's about to transition you into a new season. And I, my prayer is that all of us will be sensitive to the season that God has us in. It could just be that He's moving you to a new stage. But here's what I know. I know this. That if I will hunger after His Word, hunger after His presence, the presence of Jesus in my life is critical. It's critical for growth. And if I will hunger for Him and keep my eyes on Him, then He's going to carry me through the seasons of change. And I will continue to grow. If you receive that, say, Amen. 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 I want to ask our band members to come back. and um, I'm asking Shelly to lead the song again that you sang earlier. Uh, we are... We're going to receive communion this morning.